Today we're embracing the new year, a few months out, with a 2025 peptide rank list. I made one last year based on the best data I could find at the time, and it ended up being the most controversial video I've ever posted. And I'm not sure this one will be much different. But what makes this list special is a simple but structured algorithm I developed to place over 20 peptides into a tier, ranging from the supreme S tier all the way down to F. And yes, obviously this is a fun-loving educational channel, so there's some inherent bias. I'm interpreting the research I've read, and I gave myself room to be human, but the structure helps streamline how I came to these rankings. So, here's how it works. The ranking is based on four categories. One, efficacy, how well does the research support actual human-centered benefits, not just rodent data. I'm talking muscle growth, fat loss, cognition, recovery, all the usual optimization targets. Two, Depth of research, quality, and quantity. Is it peer-reviewed? Is it in humans? Or is it one sketchy cell culture paper from 01? 3. Safety score. Straightforward. Is it risky? Do we have long-term data? Or are we one step away from a black box warning? And lastly, 4. Personal bias. I gave myself a 10-20% wiggle room to reflect my actual experience reading through all this stuff and to keep things fun, why not? All four categories get blended into a weighted final score, with efficacy and research taking the most importance. So no, hype alone won't save a peptide, and that's why something like BPC-157 didn't land quite where people might expect. So the tier ranking is based essentially off these total scores crafted by this algorithm, that you can see on the screen right now. Feel free to disagree with the rankings, I know you will, and I welcome it with all my heart, just bring your citations. But all joking aside, let's get into it. Let's start off with SS31, or alimepratide. It's a mitochondria-targeted tetrapeptide that interacts with cardiolipin to stabilize mitochondrial membranes and reduce oxidative stress. It's been studied in conditions like heart failure and mitochondrial myopathies, with early data suggesting improved cellular energy efficiency. Well, promising from a mechanistic standpoint, it remains investigational with limited accessibility outside of clinical trials and minimal data in healthy populations. This will fit Tier C. Number two is ibutamarin, or MK677, which is something we've all probably heard of. It's technically a non-peptide ghrelin mimetic, that stimulates growth hormone and IGF-1 secretion through activation of the growth hormone secretagog receptor. It's demonstrated efficacy in raising growth hormone levels in both pediatric and elderly populations, and is currently in clinical development for growth hormone deficiency in children. Despite anecdotal reports of improvements in muscle mass and sleep quality, side effects like fluid retention and insulin resistance, are reported at times. Regulatory approval is still pending too. This one's going into tier B. DSIP, or Delta Sleep Inducing Peptide, is a poorly understood neuropeptide that was initially characterized for its proposed role in sleep regulation. Now, despite its name, evidence for its efficacy in improving sleep architecture or reducing cortisol is inconsistent and for the most part pretty weak. Most existing data are outdated or derived from animal models which haven't been replicated or translated into human studies. It remains largely theoretical, there's no established dosing or clinical application, or clarity with regards to its mechanism of action. Therefore, DSIP is going into Tier F. Tessamorelin is an FDA-approved growth hormone-releasing hormone analog indicated for the reduction of excess abdominal fat, or lipodystrophy, in patients with HIV. It functions by stimulating endogenous growth hormone release via pituitary growth hormone releasing hormone receptors. Outside of its approved use, it's garnered interest for potential applications in body composition and metabolic health in general, though human data in non-HIV populations does remain sparse. Its safety and efficacy are better established, however, than most other growth hormone secretagogues and for these reasons, it's going into Tier A. Epitalon is a synthetic tetrapeptide derived from epithalamin, studied primarily in Russian literature for its potential effects on telomere length and pineal gland function. Preclinical models have shown lifespan extension and improved hormonal regulation, but human trials are limited in size, rigor, and are poorly transparent. 
Its clinical relevance remains speculative without broader validation, and a lot of the research does come from its progenitor compound, epithalamin, which likely doesn't translate. Therefore, it's going into tier F. Terzepatide targets both the GLP-1 and the GIP receptors. In clinical trials, it's demonstrated superior efficacy to semaglutide in reducing body weight and improving glycemic control. Its mechanism supports both suppression of appetite and improved metabolic factors like enhanced insulin sensitivity. Though the long-term impacts on muscle mass, metabolic adaptation, and treatment sustainability post-discontinuation is still a topic under investigation. It's currently approved for use in type 2 diabetes and obesity, so terzepatide is going straight into tier S. Adipatide is an experimental pro-apoptotic peptide designed to induce the death of fat cells by targeting the vasculature of white adipose tissue. In primate studies, which have garnered a lot of attention, it resulted in rapid fat loss, but also raised significant safety concerns, predominantly renal toxicity. Despite its pretty novel mechanism, development was halted, it's not advanced beyond early phase trials as well, and it's particularly thought to be implicated in the death of a popular bodybuilder. Its profile remains theoretical in humans, there's no established clinical use, adipotides going straight to tier F. TB4, thymosin beta-4, something we recently did a deep dive on, it's a naturally occurring 43 amino acid peptide implicated in regeneration of different tissues, angiogenesis, so supporting increased blood flow and cellular migration. It plays a role in actin modulation, and while preclinical data support its potential in wound healing, cardiovascular repair, clinical trials have primarily focused on thalmic applications, so regarding the eye itself. Research outside of these niche indications remains early stage, and there's conflicting data on its role in tumorigenesis or promoting formation or spread of cancer. Therefore, it's going into tier C. Ipamorelin is a selective growth hormone secretagogue receptor, agonist that stimulates growth hormone release with minimal impact on cortisol and prolactin. It's often combined with growth hormone releasing hormone analogs like CJC1295 to enhance pulsatile growth hormone secretion. The fact that it's selective and agonizing the growth hormone secretagogue receptor makes it attractive for those seeking growth hormone modulation without broader endocrine disruption, more theoretical in nature. However, its standalone efficacy appears limited and it remains unapproved for clinical use. Epamorelin's going into tier D. Next, GHKCU is a copper binding tripeptide with documented roles in wound healing, anti-inflammatory modulation, and gene expression linked to tissue regeneration. Its most validated use is in dermatologic formulations, where it promotes collagen synthesis and repair of skin. Interest in systemic applications exists, particularly honing in on the field of anti-aging and through gene regulation, but injectable or oral use isn't clinically validated and systemic safety remains, in a way, undetermined and something that requires further investigation. Therefore, GHK Copper, Tier C. For simplicity's sake, Selang and Semax are going to be grouped together. Synthetic neuropeptides developed in Russia, each with distinct mechanisms. Selang is derived from Tufsin. It's believed to modulate GABAergic signaling, contributing to its anxiolytic or anxiety nixing effects. Semax, on the other hand, is a melanocortin derivative. It's thought to maybe increase expression of BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor and influence dopaminergic and glutamatergic pathways, lending it to possible nootropic and neuroprotective effects. Both are administered intranasally through the nose and have shown some efficacy in post-stroke recovery and stress modulation in Russian studies, though rigorous Western validation is lacking, as are more robust clinical trials. Overall, Selang and Semax scored into tier F. Semaglutide is a long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist. We've all heard of it, everybody in the world has. It's approved for both type 2 diabetes and obesity management. Its mechanism reduces appetite, delays features of gastric emptying, and improves glycemic control. Large-scale clinical trials have demonstrated significant weight loss, though concerns remain around discontinuation effects, gastrointestinal tolerability, given its side effect profile, and associated reduction in lean body mass, so muscle mass. Its widespread adoption, however, has made it central to the pharmacologic management of obesity, 
and has showed the world in a way more recently just how powerful these peptides can be. Semaglutide is going straight into tier S. Melanotan 2 is a synthetic melanocortin receptor agonist. It binds multiple melanocortin receptors, notably MC1R and MC4R, resulting in increased melanin production and, in some users, heightened libido and appetite suppression. Despite its popularity in non-medical contexts for tanning and sexual function, it's never been approved for clinical use. Adverse effects commonly include nausea, darkening of nevi, potential phototoxicity, and safety data remains limited, especially regarding cancer risk. This is going into tier D. MT1 is also known as aphomelanotide. It's a selective MC1R agonist, so melanocortin receptor 1 agonist, approved for erythropoietic protoporphyria, where it increases melanin to protect against phototoxic damage in a population of people who are highly susceptible to damage done by the sun, and it's a highly painful condition. Unlike melanotan 2, it exhibits minimal activity at other melanocortin receptors, offering a more targeted safety profile. Its clinical use is restricted to EPP, but interest in broader dermatologic and photoprotective applications exist. Cosmetic use remains a topic that's going to be under investigation. Aphomelanotide going into tier A. Now, reditrutide is a multi-receptor agonist known as a triple receptor agonist currently in clinical development targeting not only GLP-1 and GIP, but also glucagon receptors too. We've talked about it quite a lot. Early data suggests it may achieve greater weight reduction than existing GLP-1-based therapies, potentially through enhanced energy expenditure and appetite suppression. However, like other GLP-1 agonists, its effects on lean mass retention is a point of debate, and there's also needs to be more focus on cardiovascular safety and long-term tolerability. They're not yet established. It remains investigational, though mechanistically promising, and I'm sure we'll see it on the market within a year or two. This is going into tier B. Next, AOD9604. It's a fragment of human growth hormone, amino acids 176 to 191, known as the lipolytic fragment. It's supposed to isolate the fat-burning properties of growth hormone without affecting IGF-1 levels. While early in vitro and animal studies suggest increased fat metabolism, human trials have yielded inconsistent and largely underwhelming results. It's been approved for use as a compoundable ingredient in some countries, but it really lacks strong clinical efficacy. It's not approved by the FDA, and we've still got more to learn about its safety and use in optimization. This is going into tier F. Sermorolin is a truncated analog of growth hormone releasing hormone. Amino acids 1 through 29 in particular, not too structurally dissimilar from CJC1295. Stimulates pituitary release of endogenous growth hormone. It's less potent than some of the longer acting analogs, and its short half life does require frequent administration. And while it does mimic growth hormone pulsatility, its effects may diminish in older individuals with pituitary resistance. It's ultimately been discontinued as a commercial product, something that's in the past been FDA approved, but its use nowadays really remains entirely through compounding pharmacies. However, Samorolin fell into tier A. CJC1295 with DAC, with the drug affinity complex, a growth hormone releasing hormone analog engineered for extended half-life, allowing growth hormone release to remain elevated over several days. Its half-life is six to eight days, while Samorolin's is likely under 30 minutes. This sustained elevation deviates from physiological pulsatility and may lead to prolonged IGF-1 elevation, often used in conjunction with other GHRPs like ipamorelin, it's ultimately favored for convenience but raises even more concerns about continuous growth hormone stimulation, potential metabolic side effects, and perhaps even cancerous risk. CJC1295 with DAC is tier D. IGF-1 LR3, it's a modified form of insulin-like growth factor 1 with an extended half-life and reduced affinity for binding these IGF-1 binding proteins. It's believed to enhance muscle growth, recovery, though these effects remain pretty anecdotal outside of livestock and cell culture models and this elevation in IGF-1, this mitogenic potential, it does raise theoretical concerns about tumor promotion, and it's not approved for medical use in humans in any way, shape, or form. IGF-1 
fell into tier F. BPC-157, pentadecapeptide derived from human gastric acid, known as the body protection compound. It's shown anti-inflammatory, angiogenic, and cytoprotective effects in rodent models, particularly in tendons, ligaments, and injuries involving the gut. Now, despite its widespread use in athletic and biohacking circles, it lacks human clinical trials and has uncertain pharmacokinetics, especially when administered orally. On top of that, claims about systemic effects do remain speculative, as do our understanding of how it really works. This is one where my personal bias score was quite high. However, according to the algorithm, BPC-157 is tier D. TB500, it's a synthetic peptide fragment corresponding to amino acids 17 to 23 of thymosin beta-4. It's known as the acylated fragment. It's hypothesized to mediate some of TB4's effects on wound healing and angiogenesis, although no direct clinical data really supports this assumption, and we did a whole recent video on that. The names frequently used interchangeably with TB4 and the peptide marketplace, oftentimes provoking confusion. Its use remains largely unvalidated, and the research cited to support certain claims don't add up. TB500 is going into tier F. Now finally, MOTC is a mitochondrial-derived peptide encoded by mitochondrial DNA, thought to be implicated in metabolic regulation and cellular stress adaptation. Preclinical models have shown improvement in insulin sensitivity, mitochondrial biogenesis, and resistance to diet-induced obesity. However, Human studies are quite limited and in their early stages, and while it's interesting from a mechanistic standpoint, its therapeutic potential in humans remains theoretical pending further clinical data. And although the score will likely change at some point, currently MOTC sits at tier F. So there you have it. There's the 2025 peptide rank list based off this fun little algorithm. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know plenty of you will disagree. Some of you, maybe just a few, will agree with some of these rankings. However, I hope you did have a good time watching this. If you're looking for a way to further support the channel, please hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best thing that you can do to help me out. Other ways, there is a Patreon that I'll link below if you want to request videos or be part of this community. It's a fun place, in my opinion. And finally, I did release a recent 20-page guide on BPC-157. I'll link that in the description below. But most importantly, thank you for your time. I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.